So, a warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us today uh, for this IS Entity Connect session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the attendees that are joining us that are coming on board. Um, it's a very special session today. It's in the week of the WHA 76. We've just come back from Geneva ourselves. So uh, all the global health issues, NTD issues are very much in the air at the moment. Um, we're honored today to be joined at the end of their working day uh, for, for three of the, uh, the, uh, the participants uh, in Sri Lanka and one of the participants from um, here in Eastbourne, actually. This is a quick introduction. The session is about Dengue Sri Lanka in focus. Um, and we're joined today by uh, the National Dengue Control Unit, uh, Dr. Jagath Amasekara, the consultant community physician there, and then Dr. Laharu uh, Kolituwaku from the Disaster Management Focal Point uh, Medical Officer there at the National Dengue Control Unit at uh, the Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka, and then also Professor Nilika Malavish, the head of the Global Dengue Program at the DNDI, and also Professor uh, at the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine at the University of uh, Sri Jayawardenepura. And Dr. Dinu Garuj is also joining us from Eastbourne. Uh, also, actually, uh, the, uh, she's actually the regional epidemiologist at the city of Colombo in terms of the Colombo Municipal Council, head of epidemiology in the statistics unit, and also a consultant for the Dengue uh, Global Programme of the DNDI. So I think a round of applause for everybody. Thank you very much for, for making time uh, to, to, to join us for today. My name is Cameron Rafiq. I'm the co-founder um, and co-director at the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. It's a very uh, topical um, kind of real time situation in terms of dengue. As, as many of you know, we're aware of Sri Lanka's right in the middle or really in it's one of the first kind of it's seasonal they have two seasonal um dengue kind of uh, outbreaks this is the summer kind of um outbreak and we're right in that at the moment uh, some of the figures that we're seeing are absolutely shocking uh, i've read that we're approaching in sri lanka you're approaching about over thirty-five thousand cases since the beginning of the year um kind of roughly half from the western provinces themselves um, and that compared to the corresponding period of the last two years it's almost three times as high so we're having a look at the epidemiological uh, landscape of that um, in this session um, and there's a lot to get through um, for anyone who's joining us this session is for you and it's really so that you have a chance to ask questions in the q a uh, towards the end as well um, so there is that as well. What we're going to do is we have a running order in terms of the, uh, the, the presenters for, for the day. And we're going to kick off uh, with Dr. Jagath Amasekara from the National Dengue Control Unit. Um, so Dr. Jagath, I think we'll start with you, if that's okay. And if I could ask all the other uh, presenters just to mute the camera and the microphone on the top. It will just make things a lot easier. There we go. Uh, I'll mute mine as well. And Dr. Jagat, if you would like to start your presentation on the right hand side, and, and then we can just uh, take it from there. I'll hand the floor over to you. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Cameron. So I'll, I'll, I'll start it. Uh, yeah, if you just press, if you just start presentation. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So the, the floor is yours. It's so over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Cameron. So I, I, I will just uh, start and give a brief. Uh, 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 current dengue situation in Sri Lanka at the moment. Before that, I would like to thank you and the organizers uh, for uh, inviting us to make this presentation uh, so that we can give an update on, on the situation in Sri Lanka. So I'll, I'll uh, briefly uh, start with the, the basic information about Sri Lanka, which is uh, sort of relevant uh, to the current uh, uh, dengue outbreaks. So uh, we have a, a square kilometer 65,610 uh, so total area in Sri Lanka. Uh, the population is about uh, 22 uh, million. And uh, another important statistics I want to give at the moment is the Western province, the, one of the provinces 
uh, has uh, 6.2 million. So where the Colombo and the city, everything comes. In the Western province, it, it's uh, basically roughly about 25-26% uh, of the population is there. And we have two uh, uh, rainy seasons. Uh, May to August is the south uh, west monsoon, so uh, the direction of the rain is from that side, and the north to east monsoon is from November to February. And the urban population is uh, about 19%. So j just a brief history of the dengue in Sri Lanka. So it was geologically confirmed in 1962, and uh, for, for the, the sort of the statistics, uh, the epidemic was reported from 65 to 68, where uh, it was uh, reported about uh, 51 cases and 15 deaths. So from there, we can see the case rate and rate uh, in, in those that period of time. And uh, a significant sort of a epidemic was witnessed uh, in 1996, uh, where 1,298 clinically diagnosed uh, DHF was hospitalized with uh, 54 deaths. So that also has a CFR. And uh, it was made a notifiable disease in 1996. So just to give a recap of the, our the objectives of uh, National Dengue uh, Prevention and Control, and, and once we give these objectives uh, further, uh, the, the presentation uh, beyond that, you can see how much we, we have achieved in different, different areas uh, based on the National Action Plan for uh, 2019 to 2023. So uh, if you look at the first one, it's to uh, uh, keep the incidence or the, the, the cases uh, below uh, 100 per 100,000 population. So basically, uh, we, ha we have about 22 million. So we have to keep the cases below 22,000 per year to achieve this objective. And uh, the other one is to reduce and maintain the case fatal rate by uh, 2.1%. So, um, to ha have a, at least uh, something below uh, one death per thousand cases. So that's the two objectives. And uh, a background of the dengue. Uh, Twenty-three, twenty-three up to the uh, up to 21st of May. So up to the recent times, uh, basically from 2000, uh, the dengue fever uh, was around 10, uh, less than 10,000. So it was like 5,000, 8,000. Uh, it, it was uh, fluctuating in these uh, sort of uh, amounts up to about 2008. Uh, in 2009, we witnessed the outbreak uh, where 35,000 cases came, right? So that was like a period where it uh, just increased in the magnitude. And from there onwards, actually, we continued to witness uh, like 35,000 to 50,000 cases up to about 2016. And uh, beyond that, we have had uh, two years which had uh, big outbreaks. One would be uh, in 2017, where we had 186,000 cases. And uh, 2019 had over 100,000 cases. So those are the two ones. And the, uh, the Last year also we had had 76,000 cases and, and this year currently we are having, as uh, Captain also mentioned, we have uh, 36,176 cases up to now. So that's sort of the way that it has uh, increased and after 2009, basically I think with increased uh, awareness of the people, maybe the even the virus also must be uh, have spread more uh, from that time onwards and also health seeking for dengue the doctors uh, looking for dengue in uh, uh, people with viral fever symptoms so all that may have all attributed to this increased uh, number of cases in addition to the spread also so uh, case fatality of course we have had a case fatality uh, for example in uh, uh, 2009 it was about one percent so so you can see the magnitude of the problem when you have about uh, 35,000 uh, cases and one percent case fatality so it was around 346 deaths in that year so basically um, if that were to continue maybe in 2017 or maybe even beyond that we would have had thousands of deaths but fortunately, from there onwards, the clinical guidelines, the capacity building, 
the logistics for treatment, everything improved with so much work uh, done in that aspect. Uh, uh, so currently, we, our case fatality is on target. So uh, even last year it was uh, less than 0.1%, that is uh, 0 0.09. And now also we are having about 0.07%. So that's in a nutshell about the uh, previous years uh, in relation to dengue fever. Um, just to uh, recap about the current situation, uh, just wanted to uh, 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 show you the increases now up to 20th week in 2022 and uh, uh, up to 20th week is uh, 2023. So this is like the, uh, the previous week, which uh, ended uh, on uh, last weekend. So you can see that last year, uh, the, the, let's say, for example, if you take Western province, uh, 9,800 last year, this year 17,000. So you can see how much it has in increased. So basic picture is more or less same in other places. So uh, I take this opportunity to even show you that basically the cases are concentrated in Western province. Uh, around 50% of the cases are from one province. We have nine provinces. So out of the nine provinces, one province is having this. So this much of cases. So uh, when you uh, use the high risk approach, this province will, uh, if you can control it, you can have a uh, big impact. So that's about that. And I have highlighted two areas, Kalambu CMC, which I am sure uh, Dinu will talk about, and also Gampha, another district, to show you the different trends. So this is uh, Sri Lanka uh, uh, at the moment. So it clearly shows that uh, every year between the monsoon rains, first of all, there are two monsoon rains, uh, the southwest and the northeast. Southwest coming around April, May, that causes a peak in around uh, uh, May, June, July period. And the northeast monsoon comes around September, October, and that causes a peak around uh, October, November, December, maybe going on to January. But in between, we have a, a relatively dry, dry period and other factors are also uh, not very conducive to dengue spread. So we have a the cases come to the baseline, which has not happened this year. So that's why uh, we were a little uh, worried that it might, if the outbreak or the occurs on top of that high baseline, it might uh, further shoot up. So that's why we are strengthening a lot of activities these days to curtail this kind of uh, occurrence. So this is uh, uh, about the uh, seasonal variation. Uh, but uh, I just uh, told you about the two districts in Western province. Now see this Gampa district, the baseline is so much above. So there, there was inter uh, intermonsoonal period or between those two uh, periods. It has not come to that level uh, compared to the previous years. So uh, compared to 2022. While in the same context, if you look at CMC, the Columbia Municipal Council uh, area, it had actually come to the baseline. So there's better control uh, there during, before the, the rain. So there's some variation uh, within, the, uh, within the districts also uh, about the control of uh, dengue fever. So uh, next, if we can come to the, uh, the basically we, we talked about the, the, uh, the temporal and the spatial uh, relationships for this year. Uh, uh, to see, let's see how uh, who is getting the disease. So uh, basically, when you uh, uh, see, it's mostly males who get it, around 57 percent, and the uh, the females 42 uh, percent. So uh, maybe uh, there's a slight uh, the variation, but um, if you look at the age groups, 62 percent is working population which is a key factor when it comes to management as well because the working population or the young adults um, they are uh, two things one is uh, they are economically they are working so even if they get uh, symptoms uh, of uh, dengue uh, they are, they are continuing to do their job or uh, go for their work because it's, it's, it's economic related and it's not children Basically, children, they might go quickly to a doctor, but here they continue to go. So there is a possibility of them coming with delayed um, 
delayed admissions or delayed uh, health seeking behavior so that in turn uh, can cause complications so that is one area and also when the the the, uh, the female population also they might tend to that we have witnessed when it come to uh, sort of deaths and as well that they tend to their children and they give priority and they come uh, when they have to so 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 that also can cause uh, uh, deaths in females uh, as well so that is uh, one important thing and school going age children also around one fourth probably the deaths uh, the deaths uh, 72 deaths so when you have 76,000 cases for the entire year and 72 deaths um, uh, in a way it's less than 0.1 percent but uh, nevertheless there were 72 deaths and here female representation is slightly more as i mentioned that they uh, continue to uh, uh, care to their children if they are also suffering from dengue fever we have seen that so uh, in one or two deaths and also there were four maternal deaths also in this so uh, dengue vector surveillance we have two vectors uh, the, the the primary vector is the edc egypt type uh, vector and the uh, secondary vector is the uh, in this alpha picture so both are there uh, in different proportions uh, in the country uh, and um, if you look at cmc and all i think it's uh, uh, mostly uh, the columbia municipal council area is the primary vector so so that is how it's spread in uh, sri lanka with the two vectors and these are the containers where the uh, uh, it is vector breeding sites are so it might vary by region, but uh, if you look at a national figure, uh, the discarded items and the temporary removed items, that is some plastic items and all people remove and keep it outside the house uh, to throw them, but they never do. So that sort of things, discarded items, maybe the plastic cups and like yogurt cups, ice cream cups uh, made of uh, plastics, uh, those items. Uh, so those are key areas. Another area is the water storage. So water storage in certain districts uh, tend to have uh, uh, have an issue. Uh, that is uh, basically because uh, some areas you get water for a few hours, then they store for their purposes, and that uh, causes bleeding of the feedis vector. So this, I think, uh, Prof. Nilika will elaborate on this. And the sample size uh, may be small here, 434 in 2021 and 272 in 2022. These are certain samples that we have uh, sent to uh, for uh, virology. So uh, basically what we have seen is uh, Dengue uh, 2 uh, was about 45% and that was the uh, predominant. And Dengue 3 was 40% in uh, and 38 percent in 2022 and dengue 2 was 51 so last two years uh, dengue 2 was the more prominent one in the uh, zero times and finally i, I think I'll, I'll stop with that we have um, a sort of a, a feedback and dissemination of information we have a weekly dengue update so it carries two or three things. Maybe Lahir will explain about the surveillance system when he's uh, doing his presentation. So basically, um, every week we upload uh, our weekly dengue update to the, our website, where uh, it has the uh, districts uh, comparison with the previous year as well as comparison with the previous week, uh, and also we highlight which are the uh, districts which are uh, like. Uh, having an issue and also then we have the medical office of health areas all over the country there is about uh, over 350 MOH areas or medical office of health areas so um, within that which areas are having a sort of a high risk we highlight that and give a statistics for the previous year as well and also we give a hospital midnight burden so uh, that is a that is an aspect that we uh, generally do uh, we tell how many people per per uh, sort of a week or uh, every, every day we take the statistics of how many people are admitted and we give a sort of a value of midnight uh, how many people are staying in the hospital 
So if you compare with the previous weeks, that will give an idea of the burden for the hospital and the logistics and issues. So uh, that is also a crucial sort of a surveillance that we do, So which, which will give us an idea about uh, whether the capacity is exceeding uh, or the trend is continuing and whether we have to do other aspects. So these are just uh, briefly to recap the uh, current dengue situation in different aspects uh, in the uh, present uh, outbreak. So, uh, so these are the uh, references and the acknowledgement. So I'll just uh, uh, stop my presentation and thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very, very much, Dr. Jagath, for that. A fascinating look at the numbers in terms of the epidemiological landscape and some of the things that are happening there in Sri Lanka. We, we appreciate that. And sadly, the number of deaths this year as well, uh, something to think about in terms of uh, what to do next in this situation. Um, very interesting, the two seasonal um, outbreaks and the dry period inside. Um, we'll, we'll come to that in the Q&A, but I would just like to say thank you very, very much for setting the scene there. Uh, for that. So thanks for that. Um, I think we're going to press stop on your presentation on our side and then we're going to bring the next speaker into that. So thank you very much. So round of applause for, for Dr. Jagath as well there. Thank you. Um, that takes us to the next speaker, which is Dr. Lairu Kodotuwaku from the Disaster Management and Focal, which is the Focal Point Medical Officer actually at the National Dengue Control Unit. Um, and so Dr. Lairu, I think we're going to hand the floor over to yourself, uh, if that's okay. So the floor is yours. All you have to do, I think we'll, we can start your presentation from, from this side. So the floor is yours. Thanks and a round of applause. Yeah, for, for coming on. There we go. Thank you, Cameron. I hope I, you can hear me then. Yeah, perfectly. And we can see it perfectly as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, SMTD and uh, Cameron for giving us the opportunity to present the Sri Lanka's case uh, to a global audience. Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Jagatamra Sekhar has given us a comprehensive overview uh, on the current dengue situation. I'll be highlighting uh, some of the aspects uh, regarding dengue prevention control as well as uh, capacity building for dengue management in Sri Lanka. So when it comes to dengue prevention and control, uh, as you can see now, dengue is uh, endemic uh, disease in Sri Lanka. So we have been engaging in uh, different strategies and activities uh, for dengue prevention and control over the years. But mainly our strategies, uh, we can sort of divide them or we can sort of categorize them into six pillars, six pillars of dengue prevention and control in Sri Lanka. Uh, these have been uh, uh, mentioned and described in our national action plan as well, uh, which uh, Dr. Jagat uh, earlier uh, sort of uh, shared with us and the first pillar would be this uh, monitoring of disease surveillance uh, second one uh, vector surveillance and integrated vector management then capacity building and resource allocation for res uh, evidence-based uh, clinical care uh, followed by intersectoral coordination and social mobilization risk communication uh, and outbreak preparedness and response and innovative research. So these are the main areas or pillars of dengue prevention and control in Sri Lanka. So I'll be highlighting each and every uh, pillar in nutshell so that we can get a comprehensive uh, overview of the uh, dengue prevention and control activities in Sri Lanka. So when it comes to monitoring of disease surveillance, we do have uh, several uh, uh, disease surveillance platforms uh, for epidemiological surveillance of the uh, dengue. Uh, we have what you call DENSIS or a real-time e-surveillance platform. Uh, we use this to monitor uh, daily dengue caseload and uh, potential for outbreaks in uh, 355 medical officer of health areas, which is the grassroots level public health uh, unit in Sri Lanka. So for this system, uh, on a real-time basis, a uh, number of uh, dengue patients who are being uh, admitted to hospitals are uh, entered through uh, infection control nursing unit into the system and each and every uh, MOH around the country can see their own case load within their medical office of health area. Now, uh, suppose now yesterday we have around uh, five cases in our MOH area and today we have around 
11 to 12 cases in our MOH area. Every time uh, it exceeds the number five, uh, uh, then it automatically get highlighted. Uh, then the MOH or the uh, public health inspector who is uh, inspecting the uh, density system on a daily basis, he can uh, see what are the areas that we are having a high dengue case load and what is the potential for outbreak in this specific area. So this is the uh, real time uh, uh, epidemiological surveillance that we uh, have in Sri Lanka for dengue. Then as uh, Dr. Jagat mentioned, we have what we call dengue midnight total surveillance, uh, uh, kind of a point prevalence, uh, point prevalence where we monitor hospital bed capacities for dengue treatment and also surge capacities of 73 sentinel hospitals across the country. Now these 73 hospitals have been selected according to a risk-based criteria and according to uh, high burden uh, of dengue in uh, specific districts. Uh, the main uh, objective of this surveillance is to see whether the surge capacity or the capacity of the hospitals uh, which are treating dengue are exceeding in, uh, in a given point of time. For example, now for this week, uh, we have uh, average midnight total around uh, 768 patients per day. And previous week, uh, we had around 790 patients per day. So once you compare these uh, uh, statistics, you can get an idea whether we are exceeding the uh, surge capacity of our hospitals. And each and every hospital, we are getting the daily counts at the midnight so that we have, uh, we can prioritize resource allocations and we can uh, prioritize trainings as well based on this midnight total uh, dengue surveillance. Uh, then we have what you call the dengue viral surveillance, where we do uh, viral serotyping from 19 Sentinel hospitals as well as from outbreak areas. I think uh, Professor Nidika Malavigay's lab, Dengue Research Institute, help us with this effort as well as uh, Medical Research Institute uh, of Ministry of Health. So we, we, we have been uh, serotyping uh, from different areas, uh, high risk areas of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, to see the pattern, to see the trend of uh, viruses that have been circulating. And as uh, Dr. Jagat said, uh, we observed that dengue type 2 and type 3 was circulating uh, uh, last year, but we are seeing a predominance of uh, dengue virus type 3 this year. I think uh, Professor Nilika will explain it more. Then we have in the dissemination front, once we get the uh, data or statistics from the densis real-time e-surveillance and uh, dengue midnight total surveillance as well as dengue viral surveillance, we have what you call a weekly dengue update where we disseminate all the data uh, specifically for policymakers at the Ministry of Health and as well as uh, practitioners and operational managers at the grassroots level, mainly uh, medical officers of health and regional epidemiologists and uh, consultant community physicians at the regional level. And also, we will be, uh, we, we sort of upload this uh, weekly uh, dengue update to media as well, because uh, uh, they, are, they are sort of an important uh, stakeholder in uh, dengue prevention and control uh, for risk communication aspects. So we, will be, we, we are sort of uploading this uh, dengue weekly update into media outlets as well. So this is a monitoring of disease surveillance in nutshell uh, in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, this is the uh, dengue, uh, some of the examples for hospital dengue burden, midnight total. Uh, this is uh, this year in Colombo districts. District, as you can see, we have included all the major hospitals, National Hospital of Sri Lanka in Colombo, then National Institute of Infectious Diseases, which uh, caters for a uh, uh, major number of uh, dengue patients uh, within Colombo district, as well as other parts of the Western province. Then we have the Lederidge Hospital, which caters for the pediatric uh, dengue patients and teaching hospital, uh, Kalubovilo teaching hospital, uh, Columbus South teaching hospital. So you can see the trend on a daily basis, uh, number of patients being admitted into each and every hospital. This is the uh, same paragraph for Gampa district. Now this is the district that we are experiencing the uh, highest number of cases this time around. So you can clearly see the trend, uh, especially in uh, District General Hospital Nigambo, where we uh, has the uh, largest number of bed capacity, as well as they are the ones who are catering for large number of patients. 
then the second pillar on the vector surveillance and integrated vector management side we we have our own uh, entomologists throughout the country in all 25 district covering all 25 districts as well as health entomology officers who are doing the field work with the technical supervision of entomologists now they do their larval pupil and adult vector densities through their district streams as well as from the uh, central unit when there is a potential for outbreak the central unit will be mobilized to conduct these uh, larval pupae and adult vector density surveys and there are some sentinel surveys for routine data collection as well they have identified uh, different areas in high risk uh, localities and high risk districts to do the sentinel surveys surveillance uh, for routine data collection as well as spot surveys when there is a potential for a outbreak so these are the vector surveillance uh, that has been uh, sort of conducted through uh, national link control unit as well as from our peripheral units in the districts now uh, entomologists as well as the uh, uh, epidemiologists in national link control unit they use these uh, vector surveillance data to predict outbreaks um, for example now if you see this uh, graph now you can see uh, the uh, premise index we have calculated a cumulative premise index which you can see in the uh, green color uh, line and uh, you can also see the re uh, reported number of cases as well now there's if you examine this uh, very carefully you can see there is a one or two month lag between increase in vector indices and the increase in uh, number of dengue cases so we use these uh, vector surveillance data to predict outbreaks and predict potential for outbreaks in uh, high risk districts i think dr jagat has already uh, mentioned the uh, num uh, the diversity of uh, the uh, breeding places in sri lanka for uh, it is uh, mosquitoes these are the national figures uh, it is vector breeding sites in sri lanka for 2022 and 2023 you can see uh, the largest share has been uh, by the discarded items around 27 to 28% in 2022 and 2023 as well as water storage items so those are the major breeding sites and we we have a very robust uh, vector surveillance mecha mechanism to uh, sort of uh, get these uh, data from districts as well as from the central level and uh, when it comes to the third pillar capacity building of curative staff as well as public health staff that is the most important as uh, um, activity that we have been engaged in uh, throughout the last year actually because uh, uh, we have uh, through our predictions and through our forecasting models we have seen that uh, there's a uh, alteration in the uh, rain rainy seasons and uh, there are some predictions that we might be heading towards uh, outbreak so so as a national unit and as well as through our regional units we have been training uh, clinicians as well as medical officers of health on dengue management now uh, we have trained three major categories of the clinicians and nurses on a on an intensive five day and three day training uh, routine uh, hands on training at the national institute of infectious diseases which is the uh, premier training institute for uh, uh, dengue clinical management last year and uh, in the first part of this year we have trained over 500 uh, clinicians and uh, nurses on uh, advances of uh, dengue clinical management now these clinicians include not only uh, the government sector but also private sector hospitals in high risk districts as well as some of the post graduate trainees who will be uh, sent to uh, some of the peripheral hospitals following their training so this is not confined to internal medicine we have also included uh, emergency medicine post graduate trainees as well because they are going to be the first contact doctors in major hospitals in future and uh, we also have a one day ref refresher training on uh, dengue management for general practitioners because most of the patients will be uh, seeing a general practitioner as the first contact doctor um, in uh, urban and rural settings so we have a one day refresher training for general practitioners as well as family physicians as con uh, first contact doctors so through this capacity building we are continuously update, updating the knowledge and as well as skills of our clinicians to manage a dengue outbreak and manage high number of cases if uh, there is a dengue outbreak in Sri Lanka in coming months. 
Now, when it comes to the capacity building of uh, public health staff, or uh, for example, medical officers of health, as well as public health inspectors and public health midwives, who are the grassroots level public health workers in Sri Lanka, we have been conducting uh, uh, some of these scenario based trainings uh, for dengue outbreak preparedness, uh, mitigation and response. Uh, because we have observed that uh, since the uh, last few years, we have observed that uh, dengue comes with other hazards as well. So we, we are experiencing multi-hazard scenarios throughout the countries, dengue with floods, uh, dengue with drought, dengue with other natural disasters. So, so we have been uh, training these people on multi-hazard scenarios uh, and we have published a handbook uh, uh, for them as well, which won the uh, ISNTD uh, uh, award, global award for education last time. So we have trained around uh, 400 medical officers of health, public health inspectors and public health midwives, as well as postgraduate trainees in uh, uh, the field of public health, so that we are uh, well equipped once there, if there is any, if there is any outbreak, uh, our public health staff are strengthened and they are ready to uh, work in a very resource uh, constrained setting so when it comes to the uh, the fourth uh, pillar intersectoral collaboration and social mobilization this is uh, the most important pillar in our uh, prevention and control strategies now uh, we have what you call a presidential task force for dengue prevention and control a very high level uh, uh, advocacy platform where all the ministries and all the stakeholders that are concerned with dengue are uh, uh, sort of uh, called upon when there's an outbreak situation or when there's any threat or a potential threat for outbreak situation. For example, now uh, once the uh, president or the presidential secretariat uh, called upon this uh, presidential task force, different ministries. Uh, with uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Construction and Industries, Tri Forces and Police, all those stakeholders who are involved in dengue prevention and control come to a one coordination platform and this PTF or Presidential Task Force will be the coordination platform to, in, uh, to uh, initiate activities, dengue prevention and control activities throughout the island, not only in uh, major cities but also in the grassroots level. So there's a downstream approach uh, where these uh, decisions taken at the uh, presidential task force will be uh, sort of trickle down to the provincial level, district level, as well as uh, the village level, where village level dengue committees uh, will mobilize people to uh, dengue prevention and control activities in their own respective areas. We do have a very good rapport with uh, some of the uh, community-based organizations in Sri Lanka, for example, uh, Sarvodaya, which is the largest uh, community-based organization in Sri Lanka, as well as some of the INGOs, IFRC, uh, as well as Sri Lanka Red Cross. So whenever there is a threat of outbreak or whenever we uh, request their help, these people will be mobilizing in their numbers to help us with uh, dengue prevention and control activities, especially at the grassroots level. Uh, the other aspect of our prevention and control strategies is the risk communication and outbreak preparedness and response. As you can see, we have we had a very extensive media coverage over the last two to three weeks. For example, now our epidemiologists as well as entomologists and our regional uh, people have appeared in uh, mainstream media for more than I think uh, fifty to sixty times for this uh, the gap of uh, two weeks. So there was extensive media coverage and we do encourage media coverage as well to give the message of dengue prevention and control to uh, general public so all major media outlets uh, have uh, sort of consulted us and they are sort of helping us to uh, spread the message of dengue prevention and control through different uh, avenues for example print media digital media as well as social media platforms And when it comes to uh, outbreak preparedness and response, uh, as uh, Dr. Jagat mentioned, we have two peaks uh, of dengue outbreaks uh, during the entire year. We have one uh, just after the uh, southwestern monsoon and another in the uh, uh, northeastern monsoon. So prior to these uh, two monsoonal period, we do conduct a special island-wide mosquito control program where 
all the mohs medical officers of health officers are mobilized with the support of uh, tri forces as well as community based organizations to initiate com uh, community based dengue prevention and control activities throughout the island and uh, there are some instances where we have uh, uh, sort of uh, requested help from other stakeholders as well to uh, initiate these uh, special dengue mosquito control and prevention activities in uh, high risk areas so this is a all inclusive cohesive approach where all the stakeholders come together for dengue prevention and control activities in the grassroots level so there are some key actions that we prioritize during these uh, island wide special mosquito control campaigns we have uh, proactive premise inspection source reduction campaigns environmental cleanup campaigns as well as uh, an extensive public awareness campaigns throughout the island now these are some of the findings that we have elicited uh, from the uh, last year uh, special mosquito control campaign uh, as well as the uh, first special mosquito control campaign uh, in the first quarter of 2023 now if you can see we have inspected more than 200000 uh, premises during these uh, 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 special mosquito control campaigns out of them uh, around 65000 that is around 28% of uh, premises have become uh, potential premises for dengue breeding and we have found uh, around around 3 uh, 4% of uh, premises uh, the public health inspectors and medical officers have found uh, premises with uh, mosquito larvae uh, and if you go through or if you scan through the uh, uh, types of premises you can clearly see schools uh, construction sites religious places public places including government and private institutions they are the most vulnerable places for potential dengue breeding as well as positive dengue breeding sites so when it comes to dengue prevention and control strategies we are prioritizing our dengue prevention and control strategies based on these results generated through uh, special mosquito campaigns we are targeting schools through education ministry and other stakeholders we are targeting construction sites to our stakeholders religious places and public uh, places as well and finally uh, the last pillar of our dengue prevention and control strategies is innovative research now we have been engaged in uh, two major research international research one is walbekia project i think uh, dino can highlight some of the findings in her presentation on the valbechia project so the pilot implementation implementation was completed and we are in a long term monitoring phase where we have initiated uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, experiments into uh, to see the establishment of uh, valbechia frequency through uh, bg traps in adult edis mosquitoes and also we are doing some feasibility assessments uh, Uh, for the ongoing expansion of Walbekia from the uh, pilot implementation site and beyond, and we are considering uh, uh, expansion of this uh, Walbekia project beyond Kalamba Municipal Council area as well. And we do have another project, what you call sterile insect technique. The pilot has been conducted, and uh, we are planning for a Raja trial as well. So basically, these are the uh, six pillars that uh, we have prioritized. to uh, prevent and control dengue in sri lanka in nutshell okay thank you very much i would like to acknowledge the uh, uh, staff of Na national dengue control unit as well as our regional staff including uh, medical officers of health and public health inspectors uh, across uh, sri lanka in all 355 uh, medical officers of health officers thank you very much thank you very very much dr lahiri for that um just one second why might this camera comes back on i don't know why that's doing that just one second that was a wonderful presentation um i'm just just going to press refresh on the i'm just going to i'm just going to press refresh it comes back up uh, just give me one you hear me talking that was an excellent presentation there we go brilliant there we go thank you very much for that we were compelled you mentioned the report uh, that, that that you'd put out in terms of the award that that we were that we'd given uh, at a festival for those of you who are joined, we 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 were earlier in the year we we gave uh, the the global award for education science communication uh, for that particular scenario based training on multi hazard situations and complex emergencies the training handbook that 
and Dr. Lahiri had alluded to, um, absolutely amazing effort. And to see how that's kind of shaping or translating the way that you're working in terms of the robust nature of the engagements and the plans that you've got there and what you're actually doing um, uh, really, really underlines why we gave that award. Um, and really interesting, I love the slide with the uh, breakdown in terms of the various sites the cryptic breeding sites in construction um, having the largest number of um, notices issued uh, in terms of doing something about the larval count there. So genuinely brilliant. Um, and, I, and I wonder how that's going to kind of, kind of, you know, evolve in terms of the need uh, as this outbreak progresses, where you come to the second peak, how, how, how you're going to adapt to that. So thank you very, very much for that. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions in, in the Q&A for that. So thanks for that, Dr. Lyra. And that takes us to our next uh, speaker on this. And the running order is actually Dr. Dinu Garouj, who's the, the uh, head of the uh, Epidemiology and Stats Unit at the Public Health Department at Colombo Municipal, Municipal Council, as well as the consultant for the Dengue Global Programme at the DNDI. Uh, Dr. Dinu, I, I, I think I'm going to just give you that as an introduction and, and have <laughs> brought to you. I know we're going to deep dive into Colombo um, uh, and, and, and uh, as Dr. Lahiri was uh, uh, mentioned, just look at some of the stuff in terms of the the differences are post the wall back here pilot as well potentially but this will be really interesting to see um what's happening in Colombo. so the, the floors are the floors the floors yours all right uh thank you cameron and uh, thank you isntd and cameron for giving this opportunity uh to address and highlight this uh, really timely issue and um as cameron said i'm here to um shed some insight about the city of colombo and the burden that uh, dengue is giving to the city of colombo uh, so uh, to start starting off uh, you know as the other speakers said um dengue is a nationwide roundly a threat for us in sri lanka with dips and rises and its influence by the monsoons and the rainfalls. So when you uh, when you take the whole island, the most of the burden from dengue is incurred by the city of Colombo uh, due to its urban geographic situation. So Colombo is not big. It's a mere area of uh, 37 square kilometers with a massive population of 700,000 odd. And the problem we have in the city of Colombo is that we have a floating population, which are the migrants who commute to uh, Colombo each day uh, about 500,000. So it, it incurs around a population density of 20,000 per square kilometer, which is a vast difference comparatively to the Colombo district, which is just 3,000 per square kilometer and the country is just 300. So what we are talking about a severely dense population and severely dense area where there's like, you know, underserved settlements and vast developments going on, construction sites, schools, you name it. So it's really urban and this is like the best site for the dengue mosquito to breed and improve. So due to this um, setting of high population density provides an ideal home for the maintenance of the, the virus and its periodic generation of the epidemic uh, strains, which results in massive cluster outbreaks, which I will be portraying in a while with regards to the city of Colombo. And with the migratory factor, as I mentioned, with the floating population, uh, the Columbus City hosts the infection with the, uh, and, and then helps the mechanism of transportation new strains to the other cities. So I think as Dr. Jagat uh, in his presentation earlier mentioned, uh, we breed them and we transport them out of the city, which is not an ideal uh, situation when it comes to the uh, outer cities, which did not have much of a burden back about a de decade ago. So so I'm going to just uh, show you some um, burden pictures. This has always been the case in the city of Colombo, where this is uh, this chart so shows hundred thousand dengue case burden per hundred thousand population. So as of now, in uh, Colombo city, 302 people have got sick out of 100,000 population. And we, when you can see it with the whole island figures in the Western province, it is just second to the Colombo district due to some population differences. But CMC, the Colombo city, has the, the biggest burden of uh, caseload. So 
Um, I'm just looking, I'm just giving you a very small overview of how uh, these cases have been apparent in the city of Colombo for the last six to eight years. And you can see we always average at uh, uh, cases of like 3,000 to 4,000 per annum, which is a huge burden comparatively. So you can see only in 2020 and 2021, where we had the minimum amount of cases due to the COVID outbreaks and lockdowns, we weren't much uh, paying attention on dengue, so might have been a uh, little under, uh, underburdened due to the fact that we didn't record it as much due to others. But others, all the uh, all the years throughout, it has been the same amounts being in and out. So um, you can see this. This is actually a very interesting uh, uh, chart that I always like to show people because uh, as Dr. Jagat and Dr. Lahiru mentioned, we have seasonalities, we have dips and dips and highs. And you can see um, we always start off the year with the leftovers from the last year where we have uh, the monsoon, the end of the monsoon of the previous year gives us higher amount of cases, which which has a little bit of a high rise. And then we have a calm period, not so calm for us because we have to maintain our vector integrated vector control management in order to be secure for the upcoming monsoon in June, July. So our uh, health staff has, our public health staff has the most work in June, July. And all that, all that work comparatively, integratedly manages, uh, is, is depicting on how we act during the season of during the off season so with the monsoon so basically the monsoon starts in june may end of may and june and with the with the outbreak starts about two or three weeks afterwards as you can see in 2017 we have a, we had a huge outbreak of nearly 300 cases per week which is a massive amount uh, because i think it is one of the highest amounts ever ever in the city of Colombo or in Sri Lanka. And then it slowly goes down. So now, as you can see, the red line, if you can just take a look at it, it's it's only second to what we had in 2017. So which means we have to be looking at something which is similar to 2017. And uh, my colleagues in Colombo, Sri Lanka right now are working day in and out for this for this peak not to rise as it was back in 2017 because you know we have had the experience and the management and it has overburdened hospitals it has significant it had significant case, case fatality rates at that point of time so we don't want that ha happening and colombo city and its officials are used to this we have been dealing it at least with this kind of uh, magnitude at least for the last 10 years so uh, they know what to do and we have a different way of handling things back in colombo we have we know our clusters we know our patterns so we're trying as much as possible to integrate all the systems so that the peak doesn't happen as it had happened back in 2017. so um now there's a uh, this this slide is actually uh, so in the previous slides I've always said notified cases. So what is notified is that these are the cases which were actually confirmed. So either by a hospital administration, either by a laboratory investigation, these cases have been confirmed as dengue. But is this actually the, the real scenario? The thing is, no, uh, the notified cases versus actual scenario is, is a huge difference because uh, back in 2016, 2018, uh, we were collaborating with the project uh, with the University of Singapore and we had the opportunity of doing a census survey in the affected houses. So what we usually do is when you when we see a affected case, when we, when we get the notification that someone is uh, affected with dengue, we send our teams to that area to do uh, surveillancing if they to find whether there's breeding in that area. So while that was done, uh, people, I mean, the household, um, uh, the household was questioned regarding why any was anyone else sick? Did anyone else have a uh, febrile illness or you know feel feel unwell? And to see. Uh, usually the in the urban setting there are about six to eight people in one home in underserved settlements. So at least average of three close members complained 
effect of having febrile or non-febrile or uneasiness for the for, for the for the near two weeks. So which means it could have been dengue, which had actually gone undiagnosed. But usually the scenario in Sri Lanka is that you know when it's the pregnant ladies or the old people or the children when they are sick, when they are you know burdened with febrile illness, you would actually seek for uh, medical help. But when it comes to the working population, they would actually opt to ignore up until it's things are really serious so there's a big difference between the notified cases and the actual scenario which actually is a misconception sometimes when we are talking about our burdens and our numbers it's there is a hidden number which can be sometimes three ply and these days at least about eight ply so um we are talking now i'm i just wanted to take a small look at uh, at the age distribution in dengue uh, in colombo municipal council and the national age distribution so for the past few years i mean the trend was such that uh, about 60 percent of our dengue burden came from the little children so probably due to the transmission the highest transmission the uh, the ages of zero to 14 were notified more with dengue while the national age distribution always uh, inclined at mid-level mid-age level but as of uh, very recent years uh, years um, 2020 to 2023 i have just graded the 2023 here because we are still getting the numbers but as you can see unlike the last eight years, these numbers have been inclined towards the national level. So right now, even more adults are getting affected by dengue, just as uh, it was. So there's an inclination also of the cases uh, as of now. Um, so uh, the thing is, uh, what I just wanted to say was epidemic uh, of dengue in the city of Colombo is has always caused a significant, significant upheaval and economic loss. So the Colombo Municipal Council spends about 10% of its annual health budget, which 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 has so many other entities just for chemicals used for uh, dengue control measures. And at least 25% more of that budget goes for uh, uh, health budget is allocated for dengue control programs and other dengue related human resource activities, which is a lot comparatively to an overall budget about 25 to 30% of a health budget of a city in uh, in an urban, urban setting and for years public health officials in the city have been battling head to head with this disease and so many integrated vector control measures have been taken place we go through social mobilization risk communication outbreak preparedness capacity building trainings and innovative research uh, just as um, dr lahiru mentioned the wu bachia project was one of the first to be uh, to to take place in the city of Colombo in the northern parts and we actually had great results where the northern Colombo part were the mostly uh, was, was mostly comprised of underserved settlements we had many cases coming in before Vubashia and that's why we uh, used that area for the pilot project and now we we get minimal cases I mean the, the northern Colombo area is where we get the minimal cases as of now this this is just after about five to six years so with all that measures going on uh, all that and then fogging and spraying methods it either remains the same or you know it increases as of now it's it's the case right now so I think um, new integrated approaches of uh, is quintessential for the management and control of dengue right now because we have tried our best our public health officials do try their best i mean you can see in these pictures they are up every day at 5 a.m doing the chemical measures and you know we have national programs all inclusive cohesive approaches in par with uh, the national guidelines and our own unique guidelines but uh, the number still remains the same or it actually increases as of now so it is it's it's quintessential that uh, dengue endemic countries deserve affordable and effective treatment for dengue as we have been affected with it for over two decades now and i think uh, prof nilika might be able to shed some light about uh, what is new in line for dengue in the future for us thank you very much 
And a special acknowledgement goes out to Dr. Ruan Vijayamuni, who has been battling with this uh, epidemic for the last 13 years, most of his uh, life uh, as the Chief Medical Officer of Colombo Municipal Council Public Health Department. And special credit goes for him for getting all this data intact and, you know, uh, having us to look at uh, periods and time. So I see Prof. Neelika ready and smiling for her presentation. So I'm going to give the floor to Cameron to turn over. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Dinu. Thank you. Very scary slide there that you showed in terms of the reported <laughs> versus actual, the, the potential of being three times under the estimates that everybody's using. But there's also a gap there that should be exploited, surely, in terms of, well, we'll come to that in the Q&A, but that's something that's very interesting that, that you showed there. That slide was in particular very scary, as was the, the peak that's, you know, in terms of from June to July, in terms of this a particular outbreak or the seasonal outbreak and the peak that you're expecting. Um, it'd be interesting to see what type of integrated uh, approaches you're looking to, to to make. What are those integrations? You have, we, we'll come to that in the Q&A. Very interesting to, um, to, to see that. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate that. Um, and as you said yourself, the Sedgway, very neatly done. Uh, by the smiling Dr. Dinu there for Professor N Nilika. So I don't think I have to introduce Professor Nilika, but I will do. There we go. <laughs> Professor Nilika, uh, thank you very much for joining us, the head of the Global Dengue Program at the DNDI um, and Professor at the University of Surrey, J. Wydenepra, as well as stint in Oxford, world famous um, uh, for her work in immunology, uh, molecular medicine, uh, and so the floor is yours. I don't think you need an introduction, but the floor is yours. So over to you. We've talked a lot about all of, all of the, the landscape, what's needed, um, but what about the treatments and the potential um, there? So over to you. Thanks a lot, over to you. I think your microphone's uh, you, you muted your microphone. Yeah, you have to. All right, sorry. No, 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 that's fine. That's no problem. There we go. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, thank you, Cameron, for giving us this opportunity to talk about a bit about what Sri Lanka is facing, which is no different to what many other countries uh, globally are facing, uh, and also what uh, we are doing here at DNDI. So, just to remind people uh, where we are with dengue, uh, oh, oh, I mean, dengue has just been increasing over time. And in 2019, WHO did uh, name it as one of the top 10 threats to global health. But since 2019, a lot happened and we are having a really bad dengue outbreak in many countries. Sri Lanka is just one of them. And uh, dengue being a climate sensitive infection, uh, climate change, rapid urbanization and population expansion is making things worse. And uh, of course, the age stratified incidence, uh, disability adjusted life uh, years and, and deaths have increased uh, during, during this time. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in, uh, it was predicted, uh, this is a new site in January, uh, 2023 will be a big dengue fever year. So this is a warning from Thailand. And then you have, you know, these uh, warnings from Singapore with dengue three coming up. Argentina is battling a record outbreak of dengue. Uh, so Argentina is setting records. Malaysia is on top, as you can see, the red uh, line is, are the dengue cases in Malaysia. And you, in the bottom, you have Peru and Bolivia. The blue line is the five-year average. The gray line is what is happening uh, now. So you can see things are not looking good for many countries. And Sri Lanka is uh, another country uh, facing the same crisis. Now, a lot of people talk about the morbidity mortality associated with dengue, uh, but there is very uh, little discussion on the actual uh, economic impact. Dinu talked about the economical impact for the Colombo uh, city area with 25% of the budget uh, going for dengue control activities, which is just enormous, um, especially for countries like Sri Lanka. And it's, it's mostly countries like Sri Lanka, which are actually affected by dengue. So it was estimated that about 8 billion, uh, uh, the dengue cost about 8 billion which is far more than the cost of uh, rotavirus gastroenteritis, cholera and chagas and so on. But this 8 billion US dollars per an, uh, annually was a gross funded estimation because uh, later studies, for instance, done in India showed that the global cost of dengue in 2016, for instance, was 5.71 billion. This is India alone. So 
Dengue is a very, very expensive illness, apart from the morbidity, mortality, and disability that it causes. And coming to Sri Lanka, uh, this, this uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but the graph on your right, uh, left, uh, shows how the serotypes have been changing. And uh, I think Dinu Lahiru, everybody was talking about this massive outbreak that happened in 2017. That was because of emergence of Dengue 2. And since two, uh, 2016 until uh, you know, mid uh, 2022, we had Dengue 2 as the predominant serotype. Before that, we had Dengue 1. But since mid uh, May uh, last year, we have this Dengue 3 emerging, as you can see in green, and Dengue 3 as of now is the predominant serotype uh, in, 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 in Colombia and in other areas in Sri Lanka as well, based on our data. And Dengue 3 is not just emerging in Sri Lanka, it is emerge, emerging in many areas of the world, causing these outbreaks. So this is nothing new, uh, because you get this serotype replacement from time to time, and when you don't have, have a serotype for quite a while, then there's a huge population which is non-immune to that particular serotype. And when it is when it comes when a serotype is introduced after several years, 10, 15 years, then you have massive outbreaks. So since there are four dengue viruses, you know, this uh, cycle continues, but it intensifies uh, because of the reasons that I mentioned: climate change, urbanization, and population growth. Now Sri Lanka, of course, apart from just having cases in Colombo, we is just uh, expanding globally. Uh, you're not globally. I mean, in all areas of Sri Lanka. And as Dinu showed, uh, uh, based on our national data and uh, in in Colombo as well, you have a shift in the uh, in the population who get dengue. So, for instance, in 2000, uh, year 2000, about almost 60 percent of the cases of dengue were in children less than 19 years of age. By 2018. Uh, this fell to 35 percent so almost half of the cases uh, were going children whereas uh, like uh, this fell to like 35 percent so from 60 percent to 35 percent so the major burden of dengue is in individuals over 20 and especially in the reproductive age groups uh, and when we had the largest outbreak in colombo uh, in sri lanka in 2017 dengue was the number one cause of maternal mortality and when you have more infection in adults you have more infection in pregnant women more infection in elderly uh, who are over, over 65 years of age, and infection in those with comorbidities. So all these uh, are risk factors of developing severe disease. In, uh, di severe disease is more frequent among pe pregnant women, more frequent among all the individuals, and also uh, in those with comorbidities. So because of these reasons, dengue is not just becoming more frequent, because of the type of people who are getting infected, it is also uh, posing uh, several challenges because of increased disease severity. Now, there was a lot of talk uh, starting from uh, Jagat, uh, Lahiru and Dinu about the public health measures uh, that were used to control dengue. And better control has been the main thing uh, to control dengue in all countries. It, it, it has been either, you know, cleaning the breeding sites, uh, you know, spraying of these uh, various chemicals. And countries all over the world have been doing this for, for decades. And, it, it, and I mean, it's no secret. I mean, you can look at the data showing that vector control alone is not working. The Wolbachia mosquito control is looking great. But uh, I think all of us do realize that, you know, vector control alone is not going to work. These public health measures alone have failed to give us an answer. So then what about vaccines and treatment? Uh, idea, a, a fantastic vaccine or a fantastic treatment, would that be the magic bullet? Now coming to vaccines, of course, uh, when you roll out vaccines and also for control measures, you, it is important to uh, know the burden of dengue. So uh, a lot of people showed, uh, Dinu and, and previous speakers showed about the dengue uh, uh, serotrep uh, 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 burden in Colombo. And actually in the Colombo municipality area, Cameron, can you see my uh, pointer? No. I, we, can't, we can't see the pointer, no. Oh, all right, okay. Yeah. So okay, I just saw, uh, I know I can see the whiteboard thing that you just put on there. Yeah, you, oh, you just, such, but I can't. I, I, and so, so with the whiteboard, I should switch it off, right? Yeah, I think I think switch the whiteboard off is better, is better if you don't mind, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes, I, I switch it off. I think and uh, all right. Yeah. So, so yeah. So basically, uh, in Colombo, for instance, uh, by twenty years of age, 
97 uh, uh, percent are positive, which means they have had dengue. In, in semi-urban areas in Colombo, like Borlas Gamua, by 20 years, 80 percent of the population has, uh, you know, uh, been infected with dengue or zero positive for dengue. So we did this island-wide uh, survey one uh, in each district of the nine provinces in Sri Lanka uh, to to understand, you know, uh, the zero prevalence how many uh, infections and the force of infection. And as you can see, uh, the, the top one shows, uh, you know, all districts basically show very much lower zero prevalence than in Colombo. And the highest uh, zero prevalence was reported from Trinco, which is around, uh, you know, 66% at 20 years or overall zero prevalence of 54%. But in certain districts in the south and many other districts, it was 162 And the overall zero prevalence among children in, in Sri Lanka was 24.8%. So although dengue is a huge problem in, in Western province, and of course 50% of our cases are from the Western province, uh, the, the, in, uh, the proportion of children uh, infected in other provinces is very much less. So the question is, uh, how well do vaccines prevent infection in, in people who are not exposed? What is the efficacy rate in, in those who have not been exposed? and for different serotypes. So we do have a, a, a new vaccine coming up. It's been registered in several countries. The European Medical uh, Agency gave approval. So the Takeda TAC-003, uh, after three years, shows efficacy rate, overall efficacy rate of 62%, and that a good efficacy against hospitali hospitalization, uh, and good efficacy in, uh, in, in seropositive in individuals. However, in seronegative individuals for, uh, against dengue 3, the efficacy rate was was uh, for, against dengue three was quite uh, low, so the question is how effective is this vaccine in the context of a dengue three outbreak in zero negative children in many countries? So, so that is one aspect we need to think about, and of course there are many other vaccines coming up and, and undergoing uh, clinical trials, which is fantastic news. Now, this is a picture uh, given to be uh, by a, a leading pediatrician in Sri Lanka, and this is what our wards look like in dengue outbreaks. So this is like a COVID-like scenario. And if you remember during COVID times, when we, we saw things like this, all the high income countries were scrambling to uh, develop treatment, to, to develop vaccines, a lot of funding was put in, and we do have several vaccines and several treatment for COVID. However, when, when we have these issues in, in countries like ours, uh, and when we think about you know developing a treatment, people are like, but what about the most vector control? What about a vaccine? Why do you need a treatment? Is, is, isn't, well, what's the use of a treatment? Isn't it a mild infection? Uh, I, I mean, uh, if you have a good vaccine, won't that be enough? I mean, these questions will not be asked for COVID. Even now, where the COVID you know, incidence is lower, hospitalizations are lower, there's so many drug trials conducted for COVID because, uh, I mean, COVID does cause a burden. But right now in countries like ours, dengue causes a huge burden. But the questions are asked, why do you need a treatment? Uh, isn't a vaccine enough? And that shows how neglected this infection is. And, and people don't understand the burden of this because it does not affect high income countries. So there have been many uh, drug trials ca carried out in isolation in, in different countries. I myself have done uh, clinical trials in Sri Lanka. There are pharma developing new antivirals. Uh, but, but we don't know the affordability and access uh, uh, for, for people coming from countries like ours. So we do need a treatment to prevent progression to severe disease so that we can reduce all this mad rush and hospitalization and warning signs. So uh, DNDI uh, has put together this Global Dengue Alliance, uh, which uh, we have partners from many dengue and endemic countries in, in this uh, alliance starting from Mahidol University, uh, uh, Bangkok, Transnational Health Science and Technology Institute, India, uh, Institute of Medical Research, Ministry of Health, Malaysia, Pure Cruz, Brazil, U of MG, Brazil, and DNDI is also part of this alliance. So we have preclinical working groups, clinical working groups, translational working groups of this alliance working on, um, so, so the initial strategy is to uh, try out repurposing drugs because we know the safety of these drugs and we can rapidly then deploy them for clinical trials. So the preclinical working group is currently carrying out all these uh, in vitro assays to test so many different compounds, antiviral compounds and host directed therapies. And currently we have narrowed down certain compounds to be to uh, carry forward as antivirals. 
and undergoing testing in mouse models. Uh, and we are also uh, developing our clinical uh, plan, clinical trial protocols to test these in, um, in, in these disease endemic countries. And at the same time, uh, we have a, a less a suboptimum diagnostics for dengue. And also because we don't have a biomarker uh, to, to find out who will progress to severe disease, if anybody who, we, who has a suspected dengue infection needs to be followed daily to see who needs admission, who will develop all these complications, which is a huge burden to everybody. So uh, for, for COVID, the reason why we got out of COVID and we are okay and, and life is back to normal is because all of us came together uh, for a common goal, which is to develop a treatment and a vaccine for COVID. Uh, and we have successfully done all that. So now it's, it's time for all of us uh, to join hands and collaborate. The, the magic word is collaborate here because without collaboration, we, we will not pro, uh, uh, be able to go anywhere. So it's, it's, it's time all of us join hands and collaborate to find a treatment for dengue. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Nalika Tarfet. And what a great message at the end. I think that is the, the key to all of this. So thank you very, very much uh, for that. Uh, fascinating to see how the um, DDI's effort is expanding uh, and, and rolls out. Um, given the huge success they've already got in different disease settings with this openness, I was lucky enough just to be at the uh, World Health Assembly at their uh, at the um, the twentieth anniversary uh, do uh, in Geneva just now, and it's just that sense of openness, transparency, collabor collaboration, um, the warmth. Actually, success upon success would be really interesting to see how this applies to dengue. So hats off to all of you uh, there and happy 20th for, for the TNDI as well for that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think we've got some time for the Q&A. Um, we've got a, couple, got a question come in from one of the uh, audiences as well. So if I could ask all of the other, um, I think we have to press stop on your presentation. I think we'll just do that from here. There we go. And if you could ask everybody to put their cameras back on, um, then we can have a short kind of Q&A. Um, firstly, thank you very, very much uh, for a wonderful, uh, series of presentations, really in-depth look in Sri Lanka. Um, I think, Professor, you, you had a slide there with some of the, the kind of global context. We just saw yesterday the Peruvian CDC put out the, the National Epidemiological Alert. You mentioned Argentina. I think the figures we've seen are approaching 100,000 at the beginning of the year. I know Puerto Rico is going on. Um, and it's every year. It's every year. So in terms of these collaborations, and in terms of these, this kind of uh, desire, as, as Dr. Dino was saying, to integrate and get everybody together, because that is the way, and that is reflective of the WHO's own actual position and guidelines on the approaches to this. What are those partnerships? Yeah, I want to ask, I'm going to, what, what do you need to make this happen? You're about to enter a very dangerous phase in terms of, you know, what's coming in front of us for the next two months at least, and then again in October, to flatten that curve, to beat that, given all of the, the everything you talked about, this is, you know, dengue, the, 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 uh, the Denby 3, that particular serotype, all of it, what do we need to do? What are those partnerships? What are those? So I'm gonna open that to the floor, but we'll ask Professor first, because yeah, th there we go. Yes, so uh, clearly uh, the endemic countries uh, who are battered by dengue every year, uh, but, but you know, each country is keeping records, especially in Latin America, you know, Latin American countries are keeping records and beating their old ones. And, and you know, even Southeast Asia, South Asia, which have, you know, been pretty hardly battered with dengue are, are seeing, you know, setting records. So uh, in a way, uh, you can see when you get a particular serotype, it just spreads around the world, affecting all countries uh, and causing these issues. So, so it is just short of a pandemic, I think. Or I don't know why you can't call it a pandemic because it affects multiple continents. And because, but, but the magic thing is, uh, or, or the, the problem issue with dengue is, it does not affect high income countries. Yeah. So they do not understand uh, the, the, the problems faced uh, by all these. So, so we have, we have partnerships. I think everybody is there. And, and for instance, in our alliance, uh, we are working very closely with partners from dengue countries, 
we, we want more partners coming in uh, for the activities that I just mentioned. But what is lacking is, of course, the funds. Because if you take Sri Lanka, for instance, uh, although we would like to do it, uh, we don't have funds. We are going through economic crisis. And similarly, many other countries who are affected by dengue uh, have a situ similar economical situation as us. So because uh, this lack of funds, lack of commitment, uh, e e even by, the, by, by the, peop the funding agencies, to understand the burden of dengue, the threat it poses, and, and the way it will be going with this uh, climate change. Uh, and, and so if you don't act now uh, and, and, uh, and do something about it, have treatments, vaccines, then when it really, you know, when climate change further prog progresses and when it actually affects, starts affecting certain high income countries in the summer, then, you know, waking up and trying to find a solution won't be the right, won't, won't be the right thing to do. I mean, and that, that's a great answer, and we appreciate that. I think one of the one of the things we always hear there's not enough socio-economic modelling of the adverse effects of dengue. You went, you saw a slide with Don Shepherd, Professor Don Shepherd's work. Uh, yes. That when you do a search for socio-economic papers, that's probably the only one that ever comes up. There might be two yes, or three yes, after yes. that, right? It's so, very so, difficult. So, so, I've met Professor yes. Shepherd, Don Shepherd, in person about three, four years ago in the dengue voice thing that we used to hold in Paris very very and so committed to his work but that's one person so just to switch to, to, to involve in, in terms of different uh the the, the, the different kind of uh, points raised there are quite a few points raised just bringing that onto the gap that dr dino had shown that and that really scared me actually that the, it was a quite a scary slide you're the the uh reported to versus actual uh figures three people per household I have a mysteriously ill after somebody in the household has a lab confirmed dengue um, infection that's a gap right there how how would can that be used in terms of socioeconomic modeling towards the policy makers or the funding agencies to build the evidence base to bring in more money what's your view on that dr dinu uh, i'll just ask you that if, uh, well um the thing is uh as as we see, the gap is evident, and you know that this the the data was about I think three years no yeah. about five years ago, yeah. and and now now it has increased in massive amounts, which we still don't know because we haven't had the opportunity or the collaborations to find out how it is and all that. So with the crisis, we are handling and managing the way we can with the disease outbreak itself, and not actually paying attention to what what is not in the picture or what is not in the horizon uh, the, the the integrated management that we are talking about is is a mix of all things right because you know i think in sri lanka as of now ha has been stellar with all the public health measures that we have been doing you know we know what you're doing i mean there's set goals there's there are different uh, there's a dengue control unit uh, to to handle everything. I mean, everything is in power. Everything has has its own accordance of things where we have we have a set plan. But as Prof Nilika said, there's something missing here, right? Yeah. You know, when we are trying so hard, when all the professionals are there, when we do the research that is that is available for us and that we can manage for us. Because I, uh, back in my days, as 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 the most affected person, the most affected regional epidemiologist, I was always called upon, and we see that you know everything is set in place. There's nothing wrong with the public health measures that we are doing. Actually, we are doing a stellar job. We are absolutely great, right? You know, comparatively with the other other the other endemic countries but the thing is uh, the the missing link is is that we cannot further our our agendas without proper funding or proper plans or proper proper assistance from the countries which uh, i mean we have i mean we are just a cluster of people who are affected there's no one else coming in from the outside just to just to uh, share their assistance or you know provide some guidance into this so i mean when we working when we were working with i think dr lahiru is uh, familiar with it when we were working with Wubashia project. I mean, it was a great eye opener for us because, you know, even though it's not as much as we expected, like when we see the most most endemic areas having at least a little less cases, it it was it was absolutely brightening and enlightening for us. So I think um, all of it, I mean, integrated in the in the per perception of everything, public health, research, innovation, all of it should come and combine together. And um, as Prof. Nidika said, funding is really important because, you know, Sri Lanka is in a dire situation where 
mm. where it it needs the help that it needs and you know we need uh, we need to flatten that curve in order for that you know integration is one of the main parts i think that we have to uh, pay attention to right now and that's a great answer and and, and just staying on that the, the integration that that's needed flipping that to the national dengue control board uh, for a second i say this because and just to keep on that threefold underestimate in terms of the uh, actual the reported versus actual that's very genuinely a very scary slide because that means that all the estimates are out by three it's like what that's like an intense uh, profound thing to you know to, to see flipping that onto the national dengue control uh, board i say that you mentioned you've moved not just internal medicine, you've gone into postgrads, you've gone into emergency settings, and then they're going to be filtered out across the country. You talk, talked about put the police, even some of the armed forces, all of the various um, agencies, right, that you're reaching out with training and reaching out with your approach. Um, what about the people? These, these three people, I know that you've mentioned the, 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 the electronic surveillance stuff and all, all that. What's your plans? Is there a shadow training um, kind of um, effort? We gave you the award for the amazing work that, that you've done. Genuinely, is there an is there an effort needed for the, the those households where three people are? You know, what are your what, what are your views on that at the national control uh, board level? To, to I'll ask Dr. Lahiri, or to, to, I'll ask you both. I'll ask Dr. Lahiri first. Yeah, uh, now, uh, first let me add uh, to what uh, Dr. Dinu uh, explained. Now, uh, we have been receiving some of these, uh, some assistance from the, uh, especially from uh, WHO, World Health Organization for capacity building. Now, uh, we had a quite quite an extensive capacity building effort with the help of uh, NIID as well as uh, Professor Nilika and other uh, resource persons. So this has been funded through uh, WHO. So we have some substantial uh, funding for capacity building uh, efforts, but uh, there has to be some augmentation as well. Definitely there has to be some augmentation uh, purely because of the uh, financial crisis that the countries were yeah. under, undergoing now. Uh, and in case of uh, surveillance, uh, we are in the process of uh, sort of rethinking our surveillance system as well, because now we have we have we ha have had a very robust surveillance system like densis, but now there are some gaps uh, we have identified uh, within the system as well. So we are in the process of improving this surveillance system so that we can reach what you have uh, sort of identified the those three people that we have missed sort of the uh, asymptomatic uh, or yeah. the missed population so mm -hmm. that we can reach them as well and we can see the true burden of the dengue in Sri Lanka. So we, we need some assistance from, uh, from potential donors and uh, the leading agencies to uh, revamp our surveillance systems as well as strengthen it more so that we can yeah. uh, touch upon these uh, uh, untouched population. Now, if you go into the more community level, the, the the best uh, example would be how to reach these people through community-based organizations and community leaders. Now, yeah. these are very old models in uh, public health uh, strategies, but they do work. They still do work. Now, yeah. if you can sort of tap into these uh, resource persons within the communities, I think we can touch upon these missing uh, persons, what uh, Dinu has been mentioned so we have been investing a lot on these uh, building these uh, community uh, based organizations and community linkages and community networks and network them with our grassroots level health workers for example uh, we identify a community based organization at the national level and we inform the medical officers of health that these people are working in your respective areas and do connect with them and do build networks with these community-based organizations so that in case of an emergency or in case of an outbreak you have some resource persons where you can mobilize because these are very resource uh, poor settings uh, in uh, rural areas of sri lanka and as as well as in some of the urban areas for example even within the Columbia municipal council so so we need the strength of these volunteers we need the strength of these community-based organizations to uh, sort of uh, spread our message and to tap into the communities. So that is how we are sort of engaging with it. But 
definitely as uh, professor nilika and uh, you know mentioned we are uh, you mentioned we we need some assistance from the external parties as well i think dr jagat can add uh, thank you yeah I think you're, you're muted. Uh, 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 just, at, just at the top, you have to press the, yeah, the microphone. Yeah. Is it all right now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, as Cameron also mentioned, and uh, going on with this uh, discussion, I think uh, uh, one point I like to add is uh, about what Prof. Nelika said in the beginning uh, that about the funding. So that's very, very true. In addition, I think uh, the international uh, community, different countries. Another thing that we can do, as uh, Prof. Nelika also showed, that the, the type 3 is spreading in different countries. So that's sort of information, uh, plus uh, what are the breeding areas, what, what is the changing scenario. If we can have this, this kind of webinars or any collaboration, so that in real time we know the, the different aspects of different countries, so that we can learn from these countries yeah. and apply to our countries also. So that is also, I feel, is a very important platform or a important aspect of collaboration in addition to uh, the, the funding. And uh, a little bit about what uh, Dinu said about the burden studies. Mm -hmm. I also feel that uh, periodically we had to do burden studies in different areas because the dynamics might change. Uh, uh, as you said, there might be two or three people in addition to knowing the number, the age groups which are affected, uh, what are their social, uh, backgrounds, those things might change. So periodically, and the costing, because costings might might vary. Your economic burden might change time to time. So it's very important to continue to do this kind of periodic burden studies, and with the help of the international agencies. So that is all something that we can look forward to. A little bit about the the surveillance. What Lahir mentioned, I think uh, we are going to uh, add the real time entomological surveillance as well. So that toss will. We yeah. can, uh, good to uh, correlate with the disease surveillance. So already uh, the uh, robust sort of uh, disease surveillance is in place, which have to be improved, but into surveillance also will come into place. So those are little uh, changes that we have to continue to do. That sort of uh, uh, is my uh, take on, on this. No, no, that's a, that's a superb idea. A few years ago, so when you mentioned uh, Dr. Hasita Tissera in one of the quote in, in one of the uh, one of the slides, I think a couple of you did. We know obviously we know Dr. Uh, we know Hasita uh, Dr. Tissera very very well. Um, when a few years ago, I know he was involved very much with the, in the for, in the major outbreak in 2012 in Pakistan when he flew over there and the whole fluid management protocols were put together and the rehydration and all of that. We actually gave an award to the government of Punjab in those years, um, at, again at our festival that we, where we gave you about a few years ago, now four years ago, because they developed a real-time app. It was an app that had all the different uh, inputs that they would need to formulate policy on in terms of reaction to dengue, but it was real-time in terms of the, you mentioned some of these parameters like, you know, surge capacity, hospital beds, but they included vector control stuff in there as well. I'm just wondering what the evolution of your uh, real-time surveillance is going to take um, form in. Are you going to rely on tech? And I'm talking about social wear, like apps that can involve the community into that real-time, switch them on. Is that something that you're, you guys are looking to develop, an app-based uh, approach? Big question, but you, but you're on the spot. Uh, you want to answer later, or if you? Uh, yeah. Now uh, we have used several apps, uh, Cameron. Uh, for example, we had what you call a dengue-free child app, where yeah. a school teacher or a, a parent can uh, sort of enter details about uh, an ill child, a child who is uh, suffering from fever. The basic idea was to uh, identify any clusters developing within schools or any education setting. So we have sort of uh, um, mobile apps like that. And there are different apps, uh, uh, not by government sector, but by private sector. They have been uh, developing different apps. Now, in uh, this specific uh, uh, dengue surveillance, integrated dengue surveillance, we are sort of thinking about uh, using mobile platforms for data collection, uh, especially in uh, uh, vector surveillance. Yeah. And we will be integrating, uh, we, still we are in the uh, pilot phase of uh, these uh, mobile app, mobile platforms, but we will be integrating, surely we will be integrating uh, them into the uh, 
the main uh, dengue surveillance uh, platform. That, that, that's a great answer and very interesting uh, to see how that will develop. I, I think that's um, I think it's a very, a very much needed uh, kind of um, approach to to bring all the the people together. I was going to flip that somewhat towards Professor Nalika, because your collaboration with the DNDI has that had just the collaboration itself. We know obviously there's tremendous activity of the vaccine side. It's a private sector already looking at you know obviously and, and very successful with Takeda MSDs in the there's all sorts of things going on. Do you think your um, involvement with the DNDI is going to really catalyze uh, the policy makers in Sri Lanka to think, hang on, we need to kind of step into the gap and start to, to, to do something here and try to fund the fund what's happening in our universities, fund this, let's say this, you know, the, the app development, all of these things that are needed to, to further integrate. What kind of effect do you think you're going to have? So, so I, I I'm not sure uh, whether the government of Sri Lanka is able to uh, have have the capacity or uh, the, the, the funding to actually come in. Yeah. But uh, as far as the uh, Dengue Alliance uh, set up, you know, by the DNDI, uh, all the alliance partners, uh, starting from Malaysia, Thailand, Brazil, India, are fully committed, and they have put in funds in uh, for, for the preclinical activities themselves. So all the drug development activities uh, which the Alliance is doing is, is funded by the, their own governments from India, Malaysia, Thailand, and Brazil. And we are, we are looking into uh, getting funding for the clinical trials. So Sri Lanka's involvement of funding itself and getting involved in these trials, I mean, or, or, or the preclinical uh, development plan, that's a little bit, you know, uh, putting it, stretching it too far based on yeah. where Sri Lanka is right now. So yes, so but but, but uh, we are quite confident with the support we are getting from our partners, uh, and and because the alliance is very much united for a common vision uh, to to find a treatment for dengue, uh, and also apart from the alliance, we are I mean that's the repurposing strategy, yeah. but we are also engaging uh, with our industry partners to see if they would also want to collaborate with the alliance uh, to, to uh, you know because. We are in the process of, uh, you know, establishing this clinical network where we have this clinical platform to test different types of antivirals, hospital therapies in different patients. So we are engaging, engaging with different partners who would be interested in uh, collaborating with our alliance uh, to test different drugs, uh, diagnostics, biomarkers in, in disease endemic countries. So you could test from South, Southeast Asia to Latin America where the epidemiology is different, the virus serotypes could be different, and you know, uh, yeah. you know, the demographic uh, standard of care, everything is different. So it's a good opportunity uh, that the alliance is spread from you know Malaysia to Brazil, where you can have the platform to test uh, drugs, uh, yeah. uh, diagnostic, and 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 biomarker assays. Yes. And that's a great answer and a great future ahead, given the pedigree and the what's actually happened with the DNDI in different disease settings. Everybody was so happy to hear about a year ago, you know, a year or so ago when the DNDI entered the space. Finally, they're, 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 it was very, very good to, to know that. And a very interesting answer. On the positive spin that collaborations can give, I'm pushing this back to Dr. Dinu uh, for a second. I'm just going to ask this question. You mentioned in your um, presentation the Wolbachia North Columbia, uh, uh, Colombo um, pilot uh, and, <laughs> and ongoing project. Yeah. Their success, we deal a lot with World uh, Mosquito Program, Professor Scott O'Neill, we do, uh, in terms of we, we, we know them, we don't. Uh, we know of their work, we're in awe of their work actually. And the reason for that is all of their work's underpinned by very, very strong community engagement, developing community um, liaison, involving them in the, and you, you know this yourselves. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what have you seen, in, not just that the numbers are down, what have you seen in those communities? Are they, are they coming away more in the north of Colombo, more kind of aware of dengue, more engaged? What's your view, your view on that? Oh, well, Cameron, the thing is, we are talking about um, severely dense underserved population here with a multitude of 
you know, social problems and, you know, less care for health or, or, you know, their own sanitation. We have like, you know, huge densities. But the thing with what we saw when the WMP came in and the National Daily Control Unit, you know, spearheaded every step of the way, what we saw was, you know, it was more of a community engagement project. I think uh, I've mentioned this earlier also when uh, it was given to the, the, the community to, uh, to release the mosquitoes to hang those baskets and you know to 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 engage in themselves like sometimes you know we had initially we had problems in saying you know it was it was the surge of dengue and then why do you want to plant more mosquitoes when there are already so many mosquitoes so you know we had so much of i mean the wmp actually initiated the uh, community engagement programs education so that they actually understood that this 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 was the way to go i mean this this would help because you know at a, I mean, if, if we were talk, if we were talking about, you know, educational areas, schools and all that, you know, people would understand it. They would research about it. It's pretty easy. It, it, it's pretty easy in a setting like this. But, you know, when you talk about a highly dense, you know, yeah. uh, area as such, we had our problems. But I think WMP came through with this, you know, as you know, when we gave out those baskets and we were trying to tell them the directions where you have to put water in it, you have to put, plant it on a tree and, you know, the whole process, yeah. we actually did not, us in Colombo did not understand the magnitude of how difficult it would be to get it to the community. But so I think the WMP and the National Data Control Unit, you know, just held our hands because, you know, it was all new for us yeah. and, and it actually worked. Like, you know, so I'm not talking about massive, massive changes where we don't have any dengue cases but you know it's 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 a starting point right it's it's a headway to something that you know is is positive and um, also just to mention that uh, dr lahiru talked about um, the apps so since colombo is always you know burdened and heavily crisis with dengue we try everything that comes our way right so yeah. as i said uh, the the uh, the university of singapore the national university of singapore we had a project called the MOBAS project where we had our own app designed for the Columbus City City dwellers to inform if you have a febrile disease or you know that there were the, the app was a dualist sort of an app where we have it for the administrative level where we had for the public health inspectors where you go and uh, notify a case you uh, geotag it and like we still have the geotag so you know our uh, clusters are geotagged all of it up until now so geotag it and then find clusters find an areas find a radius make heat maps you know we have we have done it all so but when it comes to social integration with new technology um i think colombo or sri lanka is not there as yet like i think uh, you have done this flu tracking system i think that is very famous in the world where you can you know notify yourself or you know identify yeah. your coordinates uh, back in the days when it was just prior COVID 2018, it was not as uh, successful as we would, we would want it to be because I think probably unlike now, like right now, you know, internet was a problem, smartphones was a problem. And even for our public health inspectors, we had to, you know, provide uh, the utilities in order to geotag it. So we, we did it for our own staff, but, you know, to find it, to get information out of the community is we are still not there yet i think mm -hmm. in 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 terms of social mobility but wmp it was not like that you know it's it's practical it's not yes. digital you can you can take it to the people you can give it to it and and it, it was a very friendly approach and i think uh, along with it uh, just just along with it so the wmp suggested we clean our sewage lines mm -hmm. and you know the, there was a national program going in power with the whole thing so it might have been an integrated process of everything where we cleaned up where like everybody understood what dengue is all about because there were so many educational programs going on mm. so as i said it, it's just not one thing yeah. it's all of these things it's outside help it's inside help it's it's our yeah. own our own enthusiasm and our own staff's enthusiasm because if, when there's something new and when when, it, when they see it working everyone gets gets clustered and everyone tries to you know, make it work so that yeah. is the most interesting part about it uh, and, that, and that's a great answer and we, and we appreciate that and, and it is interesting we, we we gave them an award actually for their work in community but for, for the films that they make we have film mm -hmm. awards that we give out yeah. as well and this at the same time when, when dr larry and dr jagath were there uh, uh, just now actually earlier in the year so we we're completely with that is one of the missing point the missing parts is the community so we we're completely with that on that community just redefining it 
somewhat. There was a slide, uh, I think it was uh, either Dr. Jagath or it was or Dr. Lahiri who showed it. Um, there was a line uh, in terms of the uh, um, different types of transmission. So there was a line of construction sites and the larval count, but there was an interesting two parts at the end, notices served and legal uh, enfor enforced. So obviously the cryptic cryptic building, um, cryptic breeding sites rather for mosquitoes are mainly in this built environment issue. You all, you, I think all of you mentioned it's Colombo is a very severely dense, highly urban uh, setting. Um, everywhere you travel in Southeast Asia, there's some kind of, or, or Western Pacific, there's some kind of construction going on everywhere you go, right? So, it, so in terms of redefining community, what can we do with the construction industry as a community, they're a repeat offender in terms of allowing breeding. They, they really are. What, I think it was seven times, 76. It was, I can't remember the figure you just showed us, but it was in comparison to the other sites, seven times above. So what is significant? What do we do with those people, with that sector? How can we bring those in? That was a potentially a missing part of the integrated um, or the, the further integration. How do you bring them in? And that's the National Dengue Control uh, Board, to, to Dr. Jagath and to Dr. Lahiri. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good point because, uh, as you said, uh, the number of the breeding sites uh, compared to the houses and other ones are more in the construction site, as well as another area is the, the, the number of larvae produced in these sites because uh, the, sometimes the sites are like the lift walls. Right, uh, the the lift wells where the, you have a lot of water there, so the productivity of the lava also is more there. So it's a challenge, as well as uh, the population there also are temporary. They just stay there, so they are not uh, like uh, owners of a house. So, so when you uh, couple all that, it's a, it's a big challenge for the uh, to do something for the construction site. So we we have uh, got together with the uh, the construction the associations, and we are. We have discussed with them, and uh, what we are trying to do is there are uh, certain contractors rather than going to the sites. If we can get the few contractors who are doing it large scale and have some sort of uh, discussions periodically, and uh, then we can uh, like uh, uh, give some disseminate information and try to have some sort of checks and balances. We, we are trying to approach in, in that aspect as yeah. well, uh, in addition to going to those places. But uh, it continues to be a, a challenge compared to the houses and all that. I think Lahiru can add uh, in, any other aspects that. Yeah, uh, let, uh, let me add. Uh, Dr. Jagat, now, uh, uh, we have been engaging with uh, some of the authorities that regulate these construction sites in Sri Lanka. For example, uh, there's an institution called see the construction industry development authority where some of these big constructions the colgromates and all the big constructors are registered and they do have some uh, legal uh, sort of liabilities uh, so that they they are sort of uh, registered and they have been monitored by this specific organization so uh, i think uh, dinu can uh, remember very well uh, we used to sort of scan through the uh, names of the construction sites every week in colombo municipal council and we do organize uh, joint uh, inspection visits uh, with the uh, colombo municipal council uh, medical officers of health and uh, public health inspectors as well as some of the people from uh, construction uh, development in the uh, boards as well as uh, the people from the entomologist and uh, health entomology officers from uh, national Dengue control unit and that is one strategy and the second part is the uh, legislation and especially in the uh, western province we do have what you call the uh, western province structure where you have some very strict legal uh, provisions where we can uh, sort of uh, uh, do some uh, legislative activities uh, for the uh, continuous offenders in construction sites and also uh, some of the awareness as well. Now, we, we have been doing some awareness for uh, constructions. Now, when it comes to constructions in Sri Lanka, you have different levels of construction, for example, C1, C2, C3, depending on the investment that they are putting on for the construction. And they belong to different ministries as well. For example, the large colgomates, they, they belong to a different ministry. 
and the smaller uh, constructions different to uh, smaller constructions uh, they belong to another ministry so you have to have some engagement with multiple players even within the government you have several ministries so through the uh, uh, presidential task force we have been engaging these different ministries and we have sort of issued a circular in 2019 if i'm not mistaken i think Dimo can correct it if i'm not wrong uh, where we uh, we have identified health and safety officer as the focal point in every construction site yeah so right. whenever there, there's an issue with the construction site, whenever the surveillance systems uh, indicate that there's, there are patients coming in from this construction site, we used to contact these health and safety officers and advise them how to sort of refer patients to the uh, uh, healthcare institutions, how to do larviciding, how to do adulticiding, mm -hmm. and what, what are the chemicals that they, they can use. So. The, these are the uh, areas which we have sort of collaborated with construction industry, but it still remains a very critical issue uh, when it comes to dengue prevention and control in Sri Lanka. Uh, well, let me add a little. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, let me add, uh, just because uh, Dr. Lahiru mentioned that we you know we had this integrated approach. Uh, Colombo City is uh, handled by the Colombo Municipal Council, where we permit our own buildings, right? So it, it just happens, every, everything happens in one building. So we actually, without going to third party, we actually have uh, uh, the, the, the data and the sense of so what is coming up in the city prior to it coming up. So like, you know, what we try to do in the city is, you know, as soon as the proposal is in, we just, you know, identify what is coming up and, you know, we try to tell the area MOH, so this is going to come up and there'll be the problem with the construction sites as if like, you know, like as you saw Cameron with the, you know, seven tier uh, differences and whatever the notices, I think it's about a little bit of legislature also because the punishment, the 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 fine is not big enough. Yeah. You know, we have seen that practically. You know, what you do is are uh, you get notice, fine, whatever. I mean, for them to cost to incur, like we are talking about this multitude of huge high rises, which is coming in Sri Lanka, which is brilliant, but you know, which is a threat for dengue. Yeah. For them to incur a fine is better than to, you know, go on putting chemical, chemical or other prevention things just to, you know, prevent dengue. You know, there's a, there's a small gap between that. So, you know, what we try to do is like, you know, if there are three of it, like we, first you go and give a notice and then you sue them. And then, you know, what we try to do is we try to shame them a little bit. You know, we have tried a different ways of, you know, yeah. handling it. But the thing is, uh, us and the dengue control unit and the national levels, we cannot handle to give the, give the, um, chemicals or give i mean we can we can give the, the the technical ideas as to what to do it but you know to fund uh the 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 ways ways and means of vector control mm. is very difficult for us because if you're talking about you know this destroying adult mosquitoes i uh Columbia municipal council cannot be fogging 32 floors mm. or the Columbia municipal can council cannot uh, put like uh, a bait or aquatine onto water surfaces and concretes which are massive so we cannot afford that mm. so uh where, where we what we try to do is we try to get the safety control officer we give them the technology we give them the idea as to where to get it how to get it and what permitted chemicals are needed all of that is given but there's a problem between utilizing and you know falling under the trap because because it's not as so so this comes in, in i think the dengue control unit is also working on the magnitudes and cmc itself because we have our own legislature is also trying to uh, make it a better fine yeah. make it a better punishment so that people you know i know it's 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 not the best way to you know deal with things you know to scare people off be healthy it's it's not the way but you know i think in different cultural backgrounds you you, you approach things in a in a different manner it's yeah. like you know penalties using bus lanes like that you know just just yeah. like that so what we what we've tried to do is to to uh, to make what our capacity at this point of time is to give them the technology to give them the the to to, to tell them and use social media and all that to make them understand how important this, this is but to go there and do it all by, by ourselves when there are at least about 20 high rises coming i mean ongoing as an ongoing project every week is is not practical for us especially to the city of colombo so you know that's that's one of our problems there uh that's a very very interesting uh, i'm sorry uh is it possible for me to add uh, of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just uh, another thing i wanted to add is uh, like compared to the other years last year we had the economic crisis and as a result mm -hmm. uh, some construction sites 
uh, they stopped halfway and they abandoned and stopped for some time. The workers yeah. went home, just kept yeah. a caretaker or someone and closed it. So that also increased the threat of dengue last year. Now, of course, I think they are getting back together and working. So when, when it's working, probably the threat is less rather than when they abandoned and left last year, right? I, I, I think that was reflected in your slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's very, very interesting. All, all, all these things that we and, that's, and thank you very much for those answers. All these things we, we, we've been talking about, some of them under, the kind of underpinned or could be reliant potentially on re-educating these sectors or re-educating even, even these households with, you know, just a, the more not just awareness but bringing them into the fold a bit more. From our point of view, humble point, it's almost like redefining the concept of access in a weird way. Right? We just re, not really, you know, just redefining, it's not just the price of the drug or the, it's the whole shebang with it. So I want to push that to Nalika, who we haven't, but to Professor Nalika, we haven't had the chance to have. I know obviously it's not, this is not a question on the immunopharmacology. I'm a pharmacologist myself and I'm not, I'm not gonna, we're not having that, that question. But why I'm asking you this is that part of this, we're all, and why everybody was so happy that the DNDI coming into dengue is that in the past, the commitment to access programs by the DNDI for pediatric benzodiazole for Chagas, as an example, won them the PRV award in Washington. There's, there's a heightened sense of access, what it means to the community, this kind of dynamism in the way um, the DNDI approach, uh, uh, well, what we've seen, everybody's seen. So when it comes to dengue, is there a role for the DNDI, from your point of view, uh, to carry that ethos into these kind of sectors to bring them in? I know it's not the core work, but it's a kind of redefinition. Yes, so so, uh, so, so basically uh, DNDI, uh, it's fantastic that DNDI has put uh, dengue uh, in the portfolio, uh, included it end of 2021. And since then, we all countries have been, you know, uh, experiencing these massive outbreaks. And access is a huge part of uh, DNDI's vision to uh, to uh, uh, have the best treatment at the most affordable price uh, for people in, in endemic countries. And uh, so, in order to deliver this, this is why uh, this Dengue Alliance has been formed, uh, so that it is partners from endemic countries who would know. Uh, the, the type of you know treatment you need and when you say a treatment solution is it's not a drug you see uh, the, the vision of the dengue alliance is not to develop a drug but a treatment solution so a treatment solution would be identifying the patient with dengue and then giving the treat right treatment to the right person at the right time so and and uh, so all those things are very important and of course there's no question that it should be affordable so uh, so the so the goal of delivering a treatment solution for dengue, uh, we are hoping to actually achieve that in five years by, by the finishing the preclinical clinical, and the clinical development plan, including phase two and phase three trials. So I'm hopeful that uh, we will be able to achieve this. Uh, fingers crossed. We were everybody was so happy when 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 the news came that that, that the, the, the the NDI were entering dengue. And honestly, hopes are very very high. The caliber of partners that you, and the alliance that you've built is very very robust and 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 very, a good, great omen for for, for for future success in that. So hats off to everybody. Um, we're, we're coming towards the end of, I'm not very good at saying goodbyes. <laughs> we're coming to the end of, 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 of we've got a four minutes. Of, I'd just like to say thank you so much, heartfelt to everybody. There are some questions. We will uh, bring some of this in, um, I think. Um, there's something happening next month. In, on Obviously, it's ASEAN Dengue Day, June the 15th. However, June the 14th, we're going to be in the UK Parliament with the APPG uh, malaria and NTDs for, for a session on the arboviral threat and what it means to Europe. And this is, and Dr. Dini will be joining us for that. Um, and we look forward uh, to that. It's something that somebody said earlier in terms of getting policymakers to understand the threat or that kind of, so that's kind of what we're doing in, in, a, in, a, in a short kind of form way there. So that's something to look forward to. Um, I think Professor Nalika, uh, you're going to be in Bangkok for the 15th for the ADS, right? I'm actually going to be there, so I'll, I'll see you there, definitely. How about Dr. Lyra and Dr. Jagath? 
Are, are you going to be there? Are you going to be in, in Sri Lanka? What, what is the plan? For, if you don't mind me asking. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that, what about Lahiru? Uh, no. Most probably, I'll be in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll be in Nepal that time. I'm not sure. Yeah. Jagat will be in Nepal. Yeah. In, in Nepal. Nepal. Yeah. One day, one day we'll meet in person. Then this is this is why I'm this is why why I'm saying I hope one day we have the chance to meet meet in person um, to, to, for all of that. So thank you very very much for that. Um, I mean, there's so much to do. Everywhere you go, everywhere you speak, people talk about integration. The, the WHA just now, one of the major messages that you're hearing all the way through about universal health care and, and all of it is this need to integrate that. The risk factors, let's, let's say, if you just look at this, the, the risk, associated risk uh, factors, the climate change you've mentioned, all the different kind of the rapid urbanization, all, all of these things, that's not going to get mitigated by one player, is it? It's got to be collaboration. And I think you guys, you know, what, what you're doing is you're perfectly positioned and the work that, that you've already done, the great work you've already done and the experience on top of that, in terms of dengue, perfect. I think there's something very, very good going to happen. It is already happening. So, you know, I just wanted to say thanks a lot from all, from everybody who's in, in that space. Um, and, and, and and uh, thank you very much for people who are joining us. We are going to edit this video um, and we're going to return the assets to you and get it right across social media and everything. Because you mentioned Peru, you mentioned, uh, Professor Niluka, you mentioned the different, the global scene in passing in one of the slides. That's all, as, as you know, it's just going to get, there's a lot of people looking at what you're doing. Yeah, at the country level, because of what you're going through now, and again in October, November, in the, the second peak. So there's a lot of uh, best practice and a lot of interesting kind of um, uh, lines out there. I truly hope that some of this translates into the collaborations and the integrative steps that you need uh, or you're looking for. Um, so that, that, that's all we can say. You can tell I'm rubbish at goodbyes. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> We have to go, but um, I wish we had more time, but, but we don't. Um, I'd like to heartfelt thank you from the ICNTD for, for making time at the end of your working day for, for, for three of you and from East Point, such a nice weather outside. And, and yet, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and you've made time for us, even though the weather's nice. Thank, thank you very, very much. And uh, look forward to, 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 to meeting yeah, all of you, you. all right, uh, um, in the various ways. Yeah, so take, take care, everybody. All right. You good too. Goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you very much. You as well. Thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot.